good afternoon to everyone who's in uh, uh, on the East Coast, the US. Um, I'm Leela Gandhi, and I am absolutely delighted to introduce Professor Ray Langton for this public lecture under the auspices of the Humanities in the World Initiative at the Kogut Institute of Humanities at Brown University. The uh, Humanities in the World Initiative explores two areas of inquiry. The global dimension of human humanities scholarship and the role of the humanities in society. And I can think of few better to address these academic aspirations than our distinguished guest today. Professor Ray Langton was educated in India at the Hebron School between 1966 and 79. In Australia, she has a BA honors from Sydney University and the US where she gained her PhD from Princeton. She has taught philosophy in Australia, Scotland, the US and England. She currently holds the prestigious Knightbridge Chair of Philosophy at Newnham College at Cambridge University. The Knightbridge Bridge Chair was founded in 1683 by John Knightbridge, a fellow of Peterhouse, and it's been held by many eminent Cambridge philosophers, including Henry Sedgwick, who founded Newnham College in 1871. Previously, Ray Langton was professor of philosophy at MIT from 2004 to 2013. Uh, between 1999 and 2004, she served as professor of moral philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Ray Langton was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2013 and to the British Academy in 2014. She is one of five Cambridge faculty among Prospect Magazine's uh, voted list of 50 World Thinkers 2014, chosen for, and I quote, engaging most originally and profoundly with the central questions of the world today. In 2015, she delivered the John Locke lectures in Oxford's Trinity term, and for that period was visiting fellow at All Souls College. Professor Langton's path-breaking work on speech acts and social justice, as well um, as on empathy, ethics, and imagination in and through the history of Western philosophy is gathered in her numerous field-changing publications. She's author of Kantian Humility, Our Ignorance of Things in Themselves, and Sexual Solipsism, Philosophical Essays on Pornography and Objectification. Her numerous articles and essays include Speech Acts and Unspeakable Acts, Pornography, uh, A Liberal's Unfinished Business, Frances Biddle's Sister, Pornography, Civil Rights and Speech in Catherine McKinnon's edited collection, Feminism, Unmodified Discourses on Life and Law, and The Silencing of Women in the anthology, Women in Philosophy, What Needs to Change. In 2020, Professor Langton was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Klagenfurt. It is an absolute honor to welcome her to Brown. Today, Ray Langton will address us on the topic reimagining free speech. She asks, how is free speech more than an absence of bans and penalties, but also the active enablement of certain powers to speak? Uh, please join me virtually in welcoming Professor Ray Langton to Brown. Thank you so much for that extraordinarily generous welcome, Leela. It's a great privilege and a pleasure to be here. And without more ado, I'm going to ask 
what we mean by speech and by free speech, and whether or not we need to rethink speech and free speech a little bit. And I think it's a good time to ask these questions because we're seeing abuses of free speech, sometimes coming out of tyranny, sometimes coming out of flawed answers to questions like, what is speech? What is free speech? We've seen old fashioned state censorship of dissidents and the media and disturbing new forms of global electronic scrutiny. We're seeing forms of silencing from world leaders whose accusations of fake news me media erode credibility without even the bother of throwing journalists in jail. We can see that the speech of some people can silence the speech of others, but whose speech should matter and how do we weigh up speech against other values? Let's think harder about speech and about freedom. Let's reimagine speech as a freedom to do things with words, which requires resources. Resources which include rules, directive rules, and empowering rules, as I'm going to call them. And these terms are borrowed from HLA Hart, the legal philosopher. So here is the idea in slogan form. Free speech is about the protection and enablement of speech acts that matter. The protection through directive rules, rules that tell you what to do, and enablement through empowering rules, rules that create certain powers of speech acts, that means doing things with words from this perspective, and speech acts that matter given their significance. And I'm not gonna say nearly enough about the very, very big questions about which speech acts are going to matter, but there's no dodging that question. So let's begin with the speech in free speech. It's not about typing some keys or making some meaningful sounds or even expressing ideas. Saying is doing. Speech is doing things with words, as J.L. Austin said. In his examples, promising. Yes, I'd love to give this lecture at Brown. Marrying. Yes, I do, said in the context of a marriage ceremony. Voting, arguing, and much more. So when you say your words, your saying is a doing. That was Austin's idea. And if speech is doing things with words, then freedom of speech is freedom to do things with words. What about the free in free speech? Speaking can require hands-on resources, not just hands-off non-interference. When you think of freedom a hands-off way, you have freedom if no one interferes. When you think of freedom in a hands-on way, then freedom needs resources, material and social resources, pen, paper, time, education. These resources might come from the state, they might come from practices or institutions, they might come from each other as ordinary people. And drawing on HLA Hart, I want to look at a particular resource that comes from these rules, legal rules and their counterpart, social rules. Here's one more thing about the free in free speech. Free doesn't mean cheap. Freedom has costs. And this is something HLA Hart also talked about. Any scheme providing for the general distribution in society of liberty of action, he said, not only gives individuals the advantages of that liberty, but also, and now I'm quoting him, this is from a response to John Rawls, exposes them to whatever disadvantages the practice of that liberty by others may entail for them. These disadvantages include not only interference with another individual's liberties, but also various forms of harm, pain, suffering, the destruction of forms of social life or amenities, which otherwise would have been available. Hart's attention to the costs of liberty is a prescient warning of some free speech pathologies of our own time, with their various forms of harm, pain and suffering in his phrase, and of agents who don't even speak as individual citizens or human beings, but as corporations or as state and political parties, or as machine algorithms with technology enabled 
avalanches of lies and bullshit. Now, sorry about that word, but let me hasten to add that I mean bullshit in a technical philosophical sense in case you think I'm going to be lowering the tone. So what is bullshit? According to the philosopher Harry Frankfurt, and I'm quoting, the bullshitter is neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. He does not care whether the things he says describe reality correctly. He just picks them out or makes them up to suit his purpose. Harry Frankfurt's essay on this um, later was published as a small book, which became a bestseller. So it was an interesting uh, contribution. So when people worry about post-truth or fake news or alternative facts, this is sometimes as much about bullshit as it is about lies. And I have to say, our present and recent leaders are actually self-described bullshitters. By self-described, I mean that they are bullshitters. They describe themselves. They're happy to describe themselves in ways that satisfy Harry Frankfurt's description. Uh, when Donald Trump contradicted um, Trudeau about Canada having no trade deficit with the USA, he said, and you might have heard this story, he said, wrong, Justin, you do. And he later bragged, I didn't even know, I had no idea. I just said, you're wrong. Uh, Boris Johnson, closer to home for me, uh, described his journalistic writing methods as joyous hours spent in a state of semi-incoherence composing foam-flecked hymns of hate to the latest Euro infamy. So the paper I'm giving you, or the talk I'm giving you here has been in the pipeline for a while and it, and Brexit was very much on my mind when I began thinking about these issues. The costs of liberty were noted by Mill, who assumed that certain costs, such as riot and violence, would be too high. The costs of liberty have been noted by feminists and by critical race theorists, writing on contested topics about pornography and hate speech. Uh, pornography understood as the graphic, sexually explicit subordination of women in pictures or works, and um, hate speech nowadays online and with conspiracy theories selling division and hate, instructing attacks on believers at worship, mass shootings of children at school. And then, of course, Hart's wider concern about, quote, the destruction of forms of social life or amenities. This is reflected also in something he never envisaged, namely damage to the democratic process itself. So there are big questions here. And when there are conflicts between liberty and other values and conflicts within liberty itself, Hart said we must consider their relative value. We have to ask what matters more. I'll be thinking about free speech as a power to do things with words, which requires hands-on resources, including resources supplied by certain kinds of rules, legal and social. And I said that my inspiration was partly from Hart on two kinds of rules in the law. Hart distinguished rules which direct us. They might say, keep off the grass, or they might say, don't steal. And rules like that are commands, and they're backed up by threats and punishments. They impose duties, in Hart's phrase. But another kind of rule does something else. It confers powers in Hart's phrase. Empowering rules, I think, have potential to shed new light on our understanding of speech, of silence, and of freedom to speak. Hart says that the empowering rules provide individuals with, quote, facilities for realizing their wishes by conferring legal powers on them to create by certain specified procedures and subject to certain conditions, structures of rights and duties. The power thus conferred on individuals to mold their legal relations with others by contracts, wills, marriages, etc., is one of the great contributions of law to social life. And it is a feature of law obscured by representing all law as a matter of orders backed by threats. That's a, a quotation from Hart on the concept of law. Now, anyone who reads this passage, who knows their Austen, knows that Hart is building on the work of his teacher, J.L. Austen. Um, some legal rules give us powers to do things with words, such as make a contractual promise, or legally marry someone, or create a will, or transfer ownership. 
And the law creates these powers by specifying certain procedures and conditions, Austin called them felicity conditions, that enable us to create structures of rights and duties and mold our relations with each other. For instance, by contracts, wills, marriages. So empowering rules don't tell us what to do and what not to do. They give us resources which empower us as doers, resources we wouldn't otherwise have to do important things with words. And Hart said that this power conferring role of the law had been wrongly neglected by his predecessors in the law. He put the power conferring rules under the spotlight and he called them one of the great contributions of law to social life. Just I'm just underlying, underlining that. In support of the distinctiveness of these second kinds of power conferring rules, Hart pointed out that non-compliance results in something different for each kind of rule. If we don't comply with the conditions, for example, on a will, it will be, he said, a nullity without legal force or effect. It wouldn't be a breach or violation of an obligation or duty. Failing to comply with a rule about the conditions on making a will or marrying someone isn't disobedience. If you get it wrong, you haven't done something that violates a duty. You've failed to do something at all. Your attempted speech act is a nullity. It's misfired, as Austin put it. Now you might think, why is this so interesting? It's interesting for a number of ways. One is that it means that the powers to speak are built by systems of conditions that can be set by the law or they can be set by ordinary people as well. And it's also important because it gives us a way to understand silencing, drawing on this notion of nullity or misfire. Here are some examples of misfire from Austin. That I warn you, they border on the completely surreal. Suppose an authorized official stands ready to name the ship the Queen Elizabeth, but a low type, his phrase, low type, rushes up, grabs the bottle, smashes it against the prow, crying, I hereby name this ship the Generalissimo Stalin. It was an infernal shame, says Austin, but it didn't count as a naming. Suppose someone tries to marry, says I do. That doesn't, but it doesn't count because, here's Austin's example, the prospective spouse is a monkey. Where does he get these? Suppose a short-sighted saint sprinkles water on the inhabitants of a remote island. I baptize you in the name of, etc., etc. But it doesn't count as a baptism. Why not? They are penguins. He's borrowing there from a novella by Anatole France about a saint who um, short-sightedly uh, baptized some penguins thinking they were people. And the novella, um, I won't tell you the ending because I'm sure you're dying to read it. Anyway, in each case, there is a misfire or a nullity because the conditions for the Speech Act aren't fulfilled. The want of authority for the naming, the want of a suitable spouse for the marriage, the want of a soul for the baptism, the want of adequate capacity for making a will, getting back to Hart's example. The concept of a misfire or nullity helps us to reimagine silence. If speech is doing things with words, silence is failing to do things with words. One way is because your voice is censored through a directive rule saying, shut up or else. Or it might be because your voice is disempowered, your attempt is a misfire or a nullity. We're familiar with the idea that free speech can be threatened by directive rules, for instance, by bans and that free speech can be protected by directive rules that protect speech. But what about these empowering rules? What if free speech requires empowerment as well as an absence of a ban or penalty? And what if empowering rules are needed not just for these conventional or legal speech acts, but much more generally for ordinary communicative speech acts when we talk with each other or tell each other things? That's what I want to think about. Free speech is a hands-on enablement of speech act powers generally, capacities without which we're not really uh, speaking citizens at all. 
Hart distinguished two kinds of rule in the law we've just been seeing, and they can correspond to the same two kinds of rule in the social realm. So that's what I want to talk about. Free speech is achieved not by law alone, to borrow St. Paul's phrase, invoked recently in this connection by Timothy Garton Ash. The law matters, but the distinction Hart saw applies to social rules as well. And the social rules are built by institutions and by other speakers and by us. To be a speaker is to have certain powers to do things with words. And some of these need the law, not just for their protection, but for their being. And this is the role, this latter one, that Hart describes as being one of the greatest contributions of the law to social life. And many of our speech act powers don't need the law for their very being. One that Hart mentions is the power to make a promise. This needs a social practice, perhaps not the law. And we might add that the power to assert or argue or testify or tell each other things or protest or criticize, these don't exist in a vacuum. They are the stuff of communicative speech and they exist in the context of social practices to which we all contribute and to which we all contribute the empowering rules which make them possible. The power to promise, to tell people things, create structures that bind us in ties of obligation and intimacy. And this, when on this way of thinking, um, helps us imagine speech as a doing things with words, which involves powers, some of which need legally, legal empowering rules, and some of which need social empowering rules. If silence is failing to do things with words, one way I mentioned is being banned or censored. You're punished if you speak. You're silenced by Hart's first kind of rule, a directive rule. That's what you first think of when you think of how speech can fail to be free. But another way is you lack the power to speak in Hart's sense of power or something's got in the way of exercising your power. Your attempt to speak will be a misfire, as Austin put it, a nullity, as Hart put it. And when that happens, you have been silenced by a rule of the second kind, an empowering rule. How can that be? After all, I said an empowering rule creates powers. Well, here's the point. An empowering rule that creates powers by the very same token disempowers. And let's, let's think then about what that disempowerment understood as nullity amounts to. A nullity ensues, says Hart, when some essential condition for the exercise of the power is not fulfilled. Failure to conform to the conditions of the enabling rule or the empowering rule make what is said ineffective and so a nullity. This is Hart's version of what Austin called misfire. I want to emphasize that when you say something and it turns out to be a nullity, that's not like being coerced by a ban. It's not like obeying an order to be quiet because you're scared of some penalty or threat. And this possibility of being silenced in this distinctive way of being disempowered, this goes hand in hand with the empowering rule. So back to my question, how can empowering rule also be a source of disempowerment? Well, Howard himself said that the possibility of success in exercising a power by that very same token creates the possibility for failure. Here is Hart. The provision for nullity is part of this type of rule itself, namely the empowering rule. If failure to get the ball between the posts in a game of football, let's say, did not mean the nullity of not scoring, the scoring rules could not be said to exist. Rules that create a power to score a goal create the possibility of failing to score a goal. The empowering rule creates the possibility of disempowerment. Hart is right to draw attention to the power creating role of the law and to emphasize as one of the great contributions of law to social life, the law's empowerment of individuals 
to mould their legal relations with others. But now I want to point out that there is a dark cloud behind this silver lining. The law's empowering role is also one of its most oppressive contributions to social life. We regularly mould our legal relations with each, other, with each other for ill rather than for good when it comes to, for example, property or employment or contract or marriage. And this yields familiar and profound patterns of exploitation and inequity. So while he's right that the law in creating these powers uh, contributes in a very substantial way to our social life in a positive way, there is a profoundly oppressive side to this. The world we build through the exercise of these powers includes just and unjust relationships of obligation and intimacy. The rules that empower by that token disempower. In creating space for success, they create space for failure. In creating powers for some, they take powers from others. Now, going back then to Austin's examples of a misfire, trying to marry a monkey, name a ship, baptize the penguins, what crazy examples. Here are some more familiar examples. Someone tries to marry. They say, I do, but it doesn't count as a marriage. Why not? The prospective spouse is a man. And so is the speaker. Someone tries to vote, but it doesn't count as a vote. The speaker is black in apartheid South Africa. Someone tries to refuse sex saying no, but it doesn't count as a refusal. She is a wife and he is a husband. And I'm now quoting from a piece of defunct British law about marital rape and how it's impossible. The wife hath in marriage given up herself in this kind unto her husband, which she cannot retract. So under the old law, um, regarding marital rape, it was literally impossible uh, for rape to occur in marriage. And that meant that a woman's refusal of sex in marriage did not count as a refusal. That is the kind of nullity that I'm talking about, in that case created by the law. In each case, the speech act faces a problem because what is not because what is said is banned or penalized, but because its success conditions, its felicity conditions have not been met. The speaker lacks the power or something has got in the way. The speaker can say her words, but is silenced in her speech act. Those of you who know my other work know that I describe this elsewhere as illocutionary disablement, the uh, disablement of not being able to perform your intended speech act. To underline again, this silencing is not the same as the silencing of censorship. Being unable to vote is different to being ordered not to vote. Being unable to marry is different from being ordered not to marry. Disempowerment might though sometimes have a similar outcome to a ban or a threat. If you don't have the power to make your words the right speech act, you might not bother to say the words. Going back to Austin's example, if you're that low type, his imagined Bolshevik, um, who is trying to name the ship the Generalismo Stalin, if you're this low type, you won't try to name the ship if it wouldn't count as a naming. If you're a gay couple, you mightn't try to marry if that wouldn't count as a marriage. If you're black in apartheid South Africa, you won't try to vote if it wouldn't count as a vote. And under the old British rape law, if you're a wife, you might not try to refuse sex if it wouldn't count as a refusal. Powerlessness in this particular sense of powerlessness in the speech act that you're trying to perform might well prevent you even attempting the speech act. So in the examples I just gave, the law itself is speech that silences in this special disempowering way when it makes it impossible for some citizens to vote or marry or refuse sex. Now I want to say social rules can do the same as legal rules. 
To illustrate, I'm gonna draw on some feminist theorists who've argued that pornography is like the law for women. And I take them to mean this in both of Hart's ways. First, that pornography enacts directive rules backed up by sanctions. It tells people how to have sex or how to treat women or else. And second, pornography enacts empowering rules about what counts as a man or a woman and about what counts as consent or refusal. So I'm thinking of the work by Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin. And to take the first kind of rule, the directive side, I think this appears in the following description from Andrea Dworkin. She describes pornography as the Bible of sexual abuse. It is chapter and verse. Pornography is the law on what you do to a woman when you want to have mean fun on her body and she's no one at all. That's from her book, Heartbreak. Uh, on this way of thinking, pornography is a source of directives. It's like the Bible, the law on what you do to a woman. It tells people how to have sex, how to treat women. That's the first kind of rule, the directive rule. The second kind of rule, the empowering or disempowering side, this appears, I think, in the following description from Catherine McKinnon. Together with all its material supports, authoritatively saying someone is inferior is largely how structures of status and differential treatment are demarcated and actualized. Words and images are how people are placed in hierarchies, how social stratification is made to seem inevitable and right. What I find extraordinary about that passage is the parallel she is drawing between authoritative speech that is the law and authoritative speech that is, in her view, pornography. And she goes on to say, the free speech of men silences the free speech of women. It is the same social goal, just other people. So I want to put together what she says about the hierarchical structures and what she says about silencing, because putting them together enables you to see that lacking authority means you fail to fulfill the relevant condition for the success of your speech and you get silenced in this distinctive way. And according to this feminist argument, pornography puts people in hierarchies, gives some people powers and takes some powers away from people, including perhaps the power to speak. I want to connect what McKinnon and Dworkin say here with a more recent study in, done in the UK of teenage perspectives on sex where it seems that there were many teenagers for whom sex, um, for whom there were many teenagers for, te teenagers for whom consent and refusal were not visible as consent and refusal. According to British law, someone sexually consents only if he or she agrees by choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. That's a quotation from the 2003 Sexual Offences Act. In the 2013 study, a series of fictional vignettes were presented to teenagers where consent was absent. The teenager viewers tended to see it as present. And what I found fascinating was that they described their experience of uh, viewing these and their judgments about the imagined situations in quite interesting speech shack theoretic terms. Um, the teenage viewers saw consent as present in the clothes a girl was wearing. Here is, uh, in one fictitious scenario, a 14 year old girl was raped by three boys. In the teenagers' responses to that scenario, they explained why, although the girl said no, her clothes were saying yes. It was her fault for wearing that top. It started off with that top saying. It's like a door saying fire exit. You're going to go through that if there's a fire. Yes, big flashing sign saying come to me. It's like a sign on your head saying shag me. What I found wonderful about this study was that 
it asked for the judgments of real of ordinary teenagers about uh, sexual situations, and it was it's so um, important to be able to hear testimony from people who are experiencing uh, the norms um, themselves, rather than always seeing this at this sort of distance, philosophical or whatever, um, empirical distance. The report also documented the role of pornography in teenage sexual lives, perhaps illustrating McKinnon and Dworkin's claim that pornography can be like the law, perhaps even a bit like that old British marital rape law. In wearing that shirt, she has, remember the wording of that law, given up herself in this kind to the boy and she can't now refuse. And perhaps in both versions of Hart's rules, directive rules and empowering rules that at the same time disempower. So what I've been doing is reimagining free speech as the protection and enablement of speech acts that matter. The protection through directive rules and enablement through empowering rules of speech acts doing things with words that matter given their significance. Hart said that in the face of conflict and of cost, we must decide what matters. Free speech involves doing things with words where those things matter and matter more than whatever they threaten. We can't do justice here to the what matters question, but in concluding, I want to return to Mill, J.S. Mill, who said, free speech matters because it is a route to truth or to knowledge. He said free speech might need active hearers and bystanders since truth has no chance, but in proportion as every side of it, every opinion which embodies even a fraction of the truth, not only finds advocates, but is so advocated as to be listened to. Mill said, what it takes for evil to succeed is for others to look on and do nothing. I'm interested in this as it applies to our role as ordinary speakers and bystanders and hearers as we together build the rules uh, that create the space for speech. Mill also advocated experiments in living. As it is useful that while mankind are imperfect, there should be different opinions, so it is that there should be different experiments of living, that the worth of different modes of life should be proved practically. Free speech itself might be thought of as one of our experiments in living and different approaches to it as different kinds of experiments. Perhaps there is a bit more we could do to prove free speech practically. Thank you. Ray, thank you so very much uh, for that incredibly powerful talk. Uh, I want to um, uh, ask everyone here that in, you know, you'll have got a note from Trauda, so please type in your questions. Um, uh, for our speaker, um, and I will read uh, them out. Um, I already have one, uh, two, for which I'm very grateful. Um, thank you. The first from uh, an anonymous attendee asks, um, do you think that the rules of politeness primarily create space for others' speech or serve to suppress speech in order to maintain the status quo? So I suppose a question about politeness. That's a really great question. And one thing I like about the question is that you can very easily imagine situations where it could be having uh, each of those roles. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm a relative, I'm a relative newcomer to Britain, um, having been born and raised in India and then spent much of my life in Australia and the United States. And I'm very familiar with rules of politeness and how um, sometimes they can stop voices being heard that need to be heard. Um, but, uh, and so sometimes they can definitely be there to sort of shore up the status quo. But do rules of politeness also um, create uh, a space for speakers. You know, in some ways they do, and I'm not quite sure whether to bring them under the heading of the directive rules or the empowering rules. 
So one way that they might come under the, one way you might think rules of politeness connect to directive rules is that, you know, base, if someone comes down on you like a ton of bricks um, for uh, using um, uh, over the top or um, uh, you just said impoliteness, uh, politeness versus impoliteness. So just, just suppose that it's, I don't know, rude um, uh, swearing, let's say, which is not, not necessarily racist or sexist or anything else. Um, you know, there's a way in which the threat of that is, um, is going to be uh, a, a kind of social version of policing and punishment. Um, but at the same time, um, it might be creating space for the possibilities of, um, of speakers. Uh, I think I need to think about that, that example a bit more to think how it connects with the empowering rules. Um, but I think, I think there's no straightforward answer. I do believe that just as we, there's a role for no heckling rules, and this is something that HLA Hart talked about. Um, so, so there can be uh, pro-politeness social rules and they form a similar function in creating space for reasoned discussion that might not otherwise be possible. Thank you, Ray. Um, um, I, I have a, a question. I, I wonder <clears throat> uh, within the paradigms that you've given us and you think so deeply and in so many contexts about um, about felicity conditions, um, is there room for thinking about the sort of uh, doubtless peculiar instance of uh, speech abstinence? Um, you know, I, 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 because you know, sil silence has such negative connotations in the political sphere. But I, I, I was very struck by your. Uh, example of how you know male free speech uh, is a detriment to, to to female free speech, and, and they are countless. Uh, so, so what about vows of, of forms of linguistic de self deauthorization, mm -hmm. vows of silence? Yeah. So, so you brought up a really interesting um, question about how silence. Uh, doesn't have to have the disempowered meaning that I gave it. And I completely agree about that. And I just didn't don't have time to talk about it here. So um, in your example, um, um, silence has, um, silence, silence is, a, is a choice of a particular speaker maybe um and why and we would th we wouldn't think that coerced speech was a good thing uh and so we shouldn't think that you should be made to speak uh and i believe and uh, wendy brown has some really interesting work on this actually i think um th there's also a wider point about the different meanings of silence and um you know i was speaking as if um The primary understanding of silence is the inability to do something with words that you should be doing or that you would be expressing your choice or, or it, it would be a good thing to be doing. But of course, there's the silence of bad speech as well. And in, in other work, in other work, I'm wondering, I explore the possibility that a mode of resistance would be to work to disempower evil speech by uh -huh. somehow working against its its felicity conditions. Uh -huh. So basically whether it's possible to turn the tables. So uh -huh. both of these would be quite interesting and possibly positive kinds uh -huh. of, of uh -huh. silence, but in one case, because the silence itself is the expression of a choice. And in the other case, because the silence itself is the silencing of a speech that is in the words of Brandeis, some evil speech. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you, Ray. Uh, we have a, a lot of questions. Uh, uh, one um, from Kieran Mullick, who says, if you are familiar with Carol Pateman's feminist critique of social contract theory, how do you think about power conferring rules in relation to her ideas? Well, 
please. So I I really like um, Carol Pateman, but can can you ask the questioner to be a bit more specific about which bit of Carol Pateman exactly he wants me to think about? Yes, uh, Kieran, uh, could you do that for us, and uh, uh, we'll move on to other questions, and then come back come back to you uh, after your PS. Um, so uh, I have one from uh, Harley Elias, uh, um, who asks, is it possible to imagine a lingua legal system without an elocutionary disable, disablement? Are uh, elec elec elecut elecutionary, Harley, or elocutionary disablement and inequity mm -hmm. a necessary and intended bulwark of the legal system and not an inadvertent product of it. Okay, so um, I think the question is, ask, is asking me um, whether there can be the creation of powers without the creation of nullities or perhaps without the creation of bad nullities <laughs> putting it in <laughs> so it could be read either way and uh in answer to the so uh i think there can't be such a thing as a creation of a legal system that creates powers which doesn't also create the possibility of failure but it might be good that there are those possibilities of failure so um you know football is good and the rules of football um create the um power to score a goal, but those very um, rules also create the power to fail to, <laughs> to miss a goal. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so um, the same thing applies in speech terms. And so the power that we have to make a will also means that the person who's unqualified to make, make a will can't make a will. And that might be good if they shouldn't have that power. Um, um, but so, then that leaves the second option. Uh, are these lacks of powers um, or these, or these um, negative sort of nullities, do they always have to be bad? Um, uh, I, I think, yeah. So I haven't written any, I'm in general a bit resistant to describing any ideal theory of anything, let alone a legal system, but I can imagine an ideal theory of a law where all of the, um powers which also necessarily disempower disempower in a way that's good um so they disempower the, the people who haven't got the power or who don't have the characteristics that would give them the power that's exactly right they shouldn't for the very same reason that um it, it's a good it's a good thing that uh <laughs> Winning a goal requires also the possibility of uh, missing a goal. Uh, amazingly, we have 13 questions, which is absolutely thrilling and an example of how philosophers are, 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 um, are much better at this, really, at asking questions. Uh, so I, I'll gather some. There are lots of thoughts about silence, um, and I will read them out. And Kieran has come back to us, and I'll come to Kieran. So this could just be for a kind of a sort of gathering, gathering of your thoughts on silence. Um, uh, anonymous attendee asks, um, is there an opportunity for subversive silence as refusal in the face of a, a law that silences in a disempowering way? Or in other words, what's the role of the person for whom the law impacts? Are they just subject to it or is there room for recourse? And then there's another anonymous attendee who says, I would love to hear uh, more of your thoughts on silence, not as failing to do things without words, but instead achieving or being able to do things without words. That is, can we think of action or gesture without speech? I'm think thinking here of Maurizio uh, Lazarat, Lazarato's critique of the performative. And then I have um, uh, 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 Elise King, uh, uh, Guffey, who says, uh, adding to Leela's question about deauthorization and silence, can silence be considered a speech act? And uh, I think um, those are the silence questions. I'll come back to others. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, I, I really love all those questions. And um, um, in fact, let me just take this opportunity to say that if anyone has questions or would like to put their question in writing, if they'd like to follow up, just email me 
uh, later. That would be really fun. Um, so, um, uh, in a way, all of these questions um, are coming back to the point also that Leela raised about the about the different meanings of silence. Um, I think. Um, so can there be subversive silence? Um, yes, and one, uh, um, I, I mentioned one in response to um, uh, Leela before, I mean, so, so well, actually, I, no, I described a kind of subvert, look, sorry, there's so many things to say here, it's a rich bunch of questions, so let me just, so here's an example of a subversive silence. Someone makes a racist joke and you don't laugh. Okay, so that's a very familiar uh, bit of subversive silence. Um, and why is that subversive? Because a joke, a joke calls for a particular response and you are resisting uh, the situation if you don't laugh. Um, and of course you have a risk, you run a risk of being seen as, I don't know, a humorless feminist or whatever the, or if it was, if it was a sexist joke or a humorless uh, woke uh, speaker or whatever. <laughs> there are all kinds of risks, but um, yeah. And this also connects with the question about whether silence can itself be a speech act. And there's a sense in which, uh, yes, definitely a silence can be a speech act. In the case of a silence that, that meets uh, say a racist joke that sounds to me like it might well be a speech act of disapproval so you know we talk about a cold silence or a disapproving silence don't we and so a cold or a disapproving silence could readily be a speech act and I'm quite open with these because you know Austin himself was quite was you know he was happy to say that throwing a tomato could be a speech act so I'm very happy to say that a silence can be a speech act um, um, and um, and on the achieving of silence, you know, I'd like to know, I'd like to know a bit more about that before I'm able to respond. But I hope that what I've said about the different meanings of silence will bear on that too. And if not, please do follow up. Um, thank you. I'll keep reading them. And I, I uh, also just the opportunity to thank the Koga team for their incredible support and to ask uh, one of you if it's not too difficult to possibly save these questions because there are now 15. Uh, and uh, it will be wonderful um, to share them with Ray. Uh, so thank you. But I'll come back to Kieran, uh, who had the question about Pateman. And Kieran says they were thinking about her criticism of emphasizing the ability to enter into social relationships when those relationships are inherently hierarchical. And the original question was, if you're uh, in, in Pateman's feminist critique of social contract theory, how do you think about power conferring rules in relation to power groups? Yeah. So I, um, when people talk about the ability to enter into social relations, sometimes people have a normative reading of that where you're only genuinely in a social relationship if it's, uh, if it's somehow a morally or politically good uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and ones which fail on that requirement count as not being able to enter into the social relationship. And it sounds like that's where that, this particular question is coming from. And I suppose I have a more neutral way of understanding social relationships such that a hierarchical relationship is a social relationship that we enter into willingly or not. Um, so the hierarchical relationship is one that is one that we enter into willy nilly, whether we want to or whether we don't want to. Um, and it's precisely because we are um, situated in these hierarchical um, relationships that we then have powers or don't have powers or have powers to do good things or bad things or, um, have our powers disabled because of our location in this hierarchy. Um, but that, by the way, in turn me might well mean that certain uh, social relationships are not available and that will depend on wider normative considerations like, you know, 
can you um, can there be genuine relations of intimacy uh, in in a terrible hierarchy? I remember the part where Aristotle says um, one cannot be a friend with one's slave. Uh, Aristotle said that you that a slave is a um, living tool, and you can't be friends with a slave, at least not qua slave. <laughs> And so that I, I thought that was what's so terrifying about that is that he, of course, thought it was perfectly OK to have a slave. Um, but that uh, and so this was one of the first expressions of objectification, but and also about the difficulty of having uh, certain kinds of intimate um, social relationships in conditions of hierarchy. Um, so I, I think this is a great question, but a lot hangs on whether you think of the social relationship as normatively loaded or not. Um. Thank you, Ray. Uh, so we have a question here from uh, Amanda Anderson, who is our host really as director of the Kogut Center and asks, um, you ended with Mill, who of course was concerned with broader sociological tendencies that were disabling to his ideals of open debate. Specifically, the tyranny of prevailing opinion. Do you see broader sociological or political tendencies that are effect, affecting the conditions you describe more generally, as suggested perhaps in your discussion of contemporary politics? Thank you so much. Part of the reason that I wanted to quote Mill was that I, I really love Mill, but also I feel that there is a conception of Mill um, that sees him, um, as wanting to defend a rather thin conception of free speech, no matter what. And in fact, when you read Mill in conjunction with the subjection of women, um, you know that he actually um, saw prevailing opinion as being, yes, something to be questioned uh, through free expression of opinion, but also saw that it needed legal change. And he was a tremendous law reformer. Mill was involved in inspiring people who founded my college, by the way, um, Menunum College. Um, so he was a pioneer feminist. Um, and so, so the, um, you know, hands off speech was never gonna be enough for Mill. Uh, there needs to be, wider, um, there needs to be wider contribution of resources, including education and including um, the empowering rules of that are created by all of us. And I think that's where the part I mentioned at the end about listeners as well as speakers is coming in, but I didn't have time to say that, but it's a huge and, and really terrific question. And thank you so much. Um, we just have time for maybe one more question and I'll hope for the others, some of them uh, in the seminar, uh, 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 we can ask those again, some of the, the, the questioners are, uh, we, you'll see in a bit. Uh, there's a question from an anonymous attendee which says, according to the New York Times this weekend, in Sweden, truth is not an absolute defense to defamation. This has the effect of limiting women's freedom to identify men who assault them. How would you describe the inability of these women to prevent men from continuing their assaults? Okay, so I'm not aware of this particular application of that principle. The general principle that truth is not an absolute defense. I think that's a really interesting one because um, uh, there are different approaches to libel, aren't there? And sometimes libel, um, um, counts as libel because it's telling damaging lies about someone, but sometimes even if it's telling damaging truths about someone, it can end up counting as libel. Um, and um, I, I don't want to say anything about the libel case because I um, I think it is really complicated and I can't do it justice, but I, but um, it's a familiar fact that um, 
you can do a lot of damage with truths as well as with lies uh, when the truths are very selective. Um, uh, so, it, so, and some forms of uh, racist hate speech, in my view, um, might well work by extremely selective publication of certain truths. Imagine if the only truths that were ever told about a particular group were um, were truths about what member what crimes members of that group had committed. That would give a very uh, biased picture because. Uh, it would direct attention at something um, that caused false beliefs to be produced, even though the, the testimony itself was in a way true. And this brings in much wider questions about the role of um, attention and, and uh, limited information uh, in the construction of uh, prejudice. Um, I don't know about the um, particular application. I'm curious to find out more. So perhaps you could just let me know. Um, it, it sounds pretty terrible if you're if someone is not a, allowed to uh, identify a perpetrator, at least in a court setting. Though I can imagine that there might be rules about publicizing them. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Um, we're at two o'clock. Um, I keep I keep getting amazing questions. We have seventeen. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to gather these in and share them with Ray, and uh, who has very kindly offered to answer any questions uh, by email as well. Thank you for such a wonderful uh, talk and, and session and to everybody for such uh, uh, energetic questions. I can only sort of fantasize about what would this would have been like in person. And I hope we can do that uh, before too long. Thank you everyone um, uh, and uh, see, you, see you again. And I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. A huge thank you from me as well. Thank you so much for the wonderful questions and for this uh, fantastic opportunity.